Okay, so you could also, for example, have, you know, significant antagonist exposure. You know, you take a drug that actually blocks the normal activity of both metabotropic uh, and ionotropic receptors, or one or the other. And then what that would do is, like, for example, if it's the metabotropic receptor, you have a significant reduction in the, uh, you know, uh, concentration of G proteins that are, you know, released uh, in the intracellular side, right? You're going to you're, if you're blocking the normal action of the neurotransmitter at that receptor, well, you're not going to get the G proteins released, right? And then what's going to happen is you're going to have fewer second messengers, right? Because you have fewer of the G proteins, the first messenger inside the cell. So now you got fewer activated second messengers and third messengers and fourth messengers and downstream into those, you know, um, activated chemicals that would normally, you know, enter the nucleus and bind to different segments of the you know, the chromosomes and, you know, um, either maintain or alter, you know, expression of particular machinery that's important. Um, and, you know, if you have antagonist exposure, this is something that can happen. This depends, again, you know, on the particular neurotransmitter system, the particular, you know, receptor we're talking about. Um, but, you know, one, one possibility is that, you know, uh, you block the release of G proteins, right, at the membrane there. Um, so you don't get, you get fewer second messengers, third messengers, fourth messengers, and this results in increased expression of receptors to try to listen, you know, for the message that has been blocked to some extent by the presence of that antagonist. This we call upregulation. You get suddenly many more, you know, receptors that can respond, you know, to the neurotransmitter or to the drug, you know, to be blocked by the drug in this case, because it's an antagonist. Um, and you know, I want to give you just one example of this. We'll talk about this later when we talk more about psychostimulants. But nicotine is a you know very commonly abused drug. Um, it is a drug with extremely high uh, you know abuse liability. It's uh, you know a lot of people become dependent on nicotine, particularly if they you know start smoking um, cigarettes very early in life. Um, something that you know tobacco companies, of course, have known uh, and taken advantage of. Um, but what's interesting is that nicotine is going to act at a particular type of acetylcholine receptor. It's a certain subtype of acetylcholine receptor, and it's called um, the nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptor or the nicotinic cholinergic receptor. And it's an ionotropic receptor, which I think is interesting as an example of upregulation. But it basically, you know, when the nicotine, this is outside the cell here, right? Um, nicotine binds, and it's an ionotropic receptor, this nicotinic acetylcholine or nicotinic cholinergic receptor. It swings open a hole that lets sodium, but also calcium come inside. Some of the nicotinic receptors will also allow for calcium to enter. And calcium is a very powerful kind of messenger inside the cell. It gets snapped up by something, changes its shape on the inside of the cell now which then can activate like a second messenger and a third messenger. It can, this is an ionotropic receptor, but the entry of calcium in particular can initiate, you know, some biochemical cascades that can communicate back with the genes. Um, and what these receptors do, it's kind of interesting, if they get stimulated too quickly in succession, right, too much nicotine, and usually that's what, what people are smoking, there's a decent amount of nicotine there, um, they'll actually initially open and let in calcium and they'll be signaling, but then what they'll do is the, the, the receptor will shift into another conformation if it's overstimulated. It'll shift into a shape uh, whereby it will no longer respond to the nicotine or to the acetylcholine. It'll kind of shut itself off. So in some ways, the, the nicotine acts initially as an agonist. It opens it up, but then with repeated exposure and too much nicotine, which is, again, typically what people are having when they smoke cigarettes, uh, it, it acts sort of, it antagonizes the receptor for a period of time. It sort of shuts it off. So the signal drops, you know, back to the, the DNA. And that results in enhanced production, you know, uh, expression, transcription, and translation of many, many more of these cholinergic receptors, of these acetylcholine receptors, these nicotinic receptors, trying to listen in the cleft, you know, for activity. So um, if you look at smokers' brains, it's kind of remarkable how, uh, you know, if you, if you have something that can bind to the receptor and can light up, you can sort of see tremendous increases 
in the number of these receptors, tremendous upregulation in the expression of these receptors, many, many more receptors where nicotine can act in the brains of those who have been you know, regular smokers for a very long time. So all of these downregulation of receptors, upregulation of receptors, um, you know, it, they're dependent on the fact that there's communication, right, between activity in the cleft at the, at the synapse, you know, with the metabotropic, and in some cases, in the case of nicotinic receptors, with the, uh, the ionotropic receptors. But it's because they're linked to then subsequent changes in the activity in these biochemical cascades, you know, second messenger to third messenger to fourth messenger within the cell that communicate back with the genes and then can therefore alter expression. And actually, if you're interested in biochemistry and like learning more about this sort of stuff, um, you know, it's remarkable how these biochemical cascades, you know, the receptors at the, at the postsynaptic membrane, say, you know, and then linking all the way back you know, this chemical, this chemical, this chemical, back to gene expression. This is, these biochemical cascades have been preserved. The receptors have been preserved across evolution. So you can study some of these same biochemical cascades in very simple organisms or organisms that have been around on Earth, you know, for an extremely long time, as well as in our own brains. I think that's kind of remarkable. But there's this constant, you know, listening at the synapse to the level of activity and it's linked to changes in how those synapses are built. It happens not only postsynaptically, but it also happens presynaptically. So those synapses will change structurally and functionally in response to changes in activity. That can happen with you know, changes in activity just because of neuro changes in neurotransmitter release, depending on what you're doing. But it can also be significantly impacted by introducing agonist and antagonist drugs.